Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello, and welcome back. Welcome back, guys. So we're looking at green Tara, and there are two Taras. There's green Tara, and there's white Tara. And they are basically representative of either the Bodhisattva or the goddess of compassion. And also savior of the suffering. Uh, beautiful, beautiful energy. Extremely beautiful energy. An energy that feels solid and um, definite. We were talking about um, Tara and Kuan Yin last night, I think it was. And you were getting feelings of just such benevolence. Um, benevolence, uh, sh assuredness, solidity, someone, a being that you can really, really go to and count on and that it's safe to do so. Well, Tara is also known as the Universal Mother. And it wouldn't be a mistake to refer to Tara as the Universal Mother because, as mentioned, uh, her fame is not restricted to just Tibet or Buddhist teachings either. It's interesting, too, because, you know, Tara extends all over, it really, in so many ways. Uh, the Druids of Old Britain called their mother goddess Tara. Isn't that interesting? And the ancient Finnish legends speak of the goddess Tar. A tribe in South American jungles calls their goddess Tara Humara. Interesting, isn't it not? References to her are so numerous and widespread that some linguists have wondered if the Latin word Terra for Earth somehow had its roots in Sanskrit word Tara. And you know what Tara means? It means star. I like that. I love that. Yeah. And so... You know, as we've said many, many times, ultimately everything is consciousness and every star is a divine being. And and the same thing with planets, you know, planets were thought of as wandering stars or maybe stars in training, <laughs> you know, as well. When we look at like Jupiter and Saturn and there is the interesting line of thought that at one time Saturn was the Earth star and truly our the true history of this world has been completely covered up. Our true history has been really covered up. And uh, it's in order to keep us in darkness. But we are now exiting the Kali Yuga. And we're heading into Dwapara. And so the light is shining upon us. Definitely. We have a lot of light shining upon us. And that gives us the desire to go out and search. And a lot of you guys out there are searchers. So this is really an honor to be able to bring a being like this to you because I feel you could go to her with anything and she would give you back compassion and understanding. So then we also have the American uh, natives, the, uh, the Cheyenne, for instance, speak of a star woman who fell to earth from the heavens, out of whose body grew all essential food. Mm. See, we've been so disconnected from the mother, from the goddess, from the divine feminine, uh, and again, very, very purposefully, in order to keep us not, well, unrooted, unstable, and easier to manipulate, is it's it's part of this whole doctrine that the Western society has had. And, you know, how often do you hear of our father, our father, our father, never reference to the mother. Also because, you know, this culture that we live in has been one that's been dominated by war and conquest. And, you know, conquering others, taking their riches, and assimilate them, you know, assimilate them into this Borg of basically uh, conquest, greed, and everything that we've seen, you know, in this in this Western society, which has led to the destruction of the earth, the poisoning of the waters, you know, the raping and pillaging of the land and all the native peoples, uh, kicking them off their own land into little, you know, corners, little, uh, usually very very poor land. They've they've brought them into the reservations. If you go, go to most reservations, they're they're fairly barren and and they're not and, and they're definitely not prime real estate, so to speak. But they still are are in a blessed area because of their relationship with the mother that they've never forgotten. Right, they can manipulate their environment so it can bless them back. But still, it's just so wrong how they've been 
removed and put in places that were not as abundant and then even given certain rules and laws to follow. So to Tibetans, she's known simply as the mother, the savioress, and the protectress. There are numerous accounts of her assisting Tibetan refugees who fled the Chinese occupation of their homeland, which is a horrible story as well, you know, what's happened to Tibet. Many stories contain the following types of scenarios. The Flean Tibetans came to a place where the path splits into two, one through a valley, the other over a high pass. Although the divergent paths rejoined farther later on, one must, one must choose to follow now. The refugees choose the path indicated by Tara and one of the party's dreams, only to later hear of a Chinese patrol that they narrowly missed by following Tara's instructions. Another typical story is that of a monk who, while in deep meditation, received a message from Tara insisting that a planned trip be delayed. The monk is warned that there will be a disaster if the party leaves as planned, so the departure was set back a week. Two days later, a huge snowstorm moved in. If they had left on their original schedule, the party would have been trapped, stranded, and possibly died. Wow. This is listening to that inner voice, and I've shared with you guys um, that my spiritual journey started at five with the death of my brother, um, handing the Bible and some Catholic, Catholic missiles to a neighbor who could read to read to me because I had to have all the answers and then went through the Bible cover to cover at 11, started to delve into anything and everything I could that was a quest for knowledge. Uh, I remember through junior high, I took out every book on the paranormal, on ESP, on psychic abilities, intuition, how to develop them. Everything led to meditation uh, and led to other things as well, like hermeticism, understanding the Western mystery tradition, and then led into uh, start studying the Eastern past too, at around 12, 13. Uh, and Buddhism was one of the first things that I studied as I had joined a karate school and was just everything Eastern was always grabbing my attention. Um, and then from there, delved into every path I could think of, including pagan paths, too. And when you study all these different traditions, they all have common common cores, common roots. There really is really, when you look at it, there's kind of your Western fundamentalist way of looking at things. And then there's everybody else. Um, and everybody else views the world as being much more magical and full of different beings and life and and. It's just a very, very much more in tune with nature and the different uh, seasons and rhythms of nature. So, you know, I did go down the pagan path for a while. And whenever I would just connect, uh, even if I was just connecting to goddess energy, you know, just, you know, energy of the divine feminine without any names, I, I always still got answers right away right away it was amazing you know I one time I was doing a uh, meditation and then a little ritual afterwards and asked for a sign and there was a knock on the door this was like midnight and there was a little black hat there that had never been never seen before it just looked at me when I opened up the door and it left you know that type of thing we've had um, birds come into the house and the same bird come fly into the house twice <laughs> on, on days um, kind of giving us a message and even you know sitting in the doorway looking at us like really trying to get our attention before leaving and all kinds of different birds too that one time when I sensed Lakshmi and I told you and it wasn't I don't know five minutes later we had like hundreds and hundreds of birds different kinds of birds blue birds robins all kinds of stuff all over the house so if if you look for this stuff and you're open to it to receive answers from the divine it'll show itself most definitely most definitely so tara has more than one aspect and there are a total of 21 taras found in tibetan lore but she's primarily worshipped today in two forms the green tara and the white tara her most famous representation is as green tara which is a dynamic aspect of compassion propitiated as green tara uh, and let's just take a peek here so you can see the two. So that's green Tara right there. And then we have white Tara. 
So green Tara is the dynamic aspect of compassion propitiated to overcome difficulties of all kinds, called the mother of the Buddhas, past, present, and future. Tara is found everywhere, irrespective of sect, creed, or particular Buddhist practice. She sits on the private altar of monks throughout the world, regardless of the order in which they belong. In mental disciplines for which the Tibetans are renowned, Tara is often described as a dynamically powerful archetype for our own inner wisdom. Here, Tara is an instrument for transformation of consciousness, another kind of journey to spiritual freedom. Tara protects those who are called to her with her mantras, but she also knows very well how to take care of herself as well. And, you know, there's different aspects to all these goddesses. And we've touched on that before. Like, you know, for instance, you know, Durga is a very, very powerful aspect of really all the goddesses and the gods put together. Now, White Tara can destroy poisons, make one invincible, emanate various rays of light, give deep peace, bestows divine creativity, and bestow long life. And um, there are other ones like we were talking about, like a pink Tara, which is saviorous of scented forests, destroyer of opposing forces, conqueror of the worldly realms, swiftest of the heroines, she who blesses mountain-dwelling medicants. Uh, light brown Tara, she who ensures victory, giver of supreme virtue, she who is auspiciousness itself. Dark tan Tara, blazing light and provider of wealth. Green Tara, mother of the Buddhas and incomparable saviors as we've talked about. So green Tara is the one that is prayed to the most. But there are many different aspects. And, you know, we see the light and dark duality there too. Um, you know, goddess of compassion, but then also that warrior aspect to protect those that deserve protection. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, a mother would, and that's what she wants to do. She wants to protect our children, and many times moms will go to, oh my gosh, so many different uh, means to protect their children, and I really feel like she would do what it takes or at least give you the knowledge and the information that you need to feel inspired to help yourself move to the next level. So again, if every star is a divine being, so we, we, we're looking in our 3D eyes up at the stars, we see them as big lights, right? And when we look at the sun, it's a typical star of a certain class and it just looks like a ball of energy yet ourselves if we look at ourselves and use our our third eye insight we could see that we are really just balls of energy too in a different aspect of reality so these stars and planets are living out lives like we have uh like we are currently on different planes of existence, on the higher dimensions. And that's why, you know, they are referred to in many cases as gods or goddesses, Elohim. There's different terms for them. We recognize that as enormous and with as much energy as they have, um, you know, they're much, they're at a much higher state of being than a typical human right here and right now. Of course, in the sea of consciousness, the ultimate truth is that we're all one in this ocean. It's it's just individual drops in the ocean. But, you know, we can't deny that they've achieved a certain state of consciousness, a certain level of being. And so they're able to provide life-giving light, heat, warmth, everything that's needed for life to a, a much higher, a much greater number of individual jivas if we're using the sanskrit term individual beings then perhaps we are and now each one of our bodies is providing life for billions of of beings you know bacteria are living inside us you know our microbiome so again we we are a universe unto them ourselves and yet you know we are dwarfed by the size of these beings and just take you know earth itself the earth is a conscious being you know that's just that's just a fact if if you look and you go within you'll recognize that the earth is alive and conscious and so you know tara is a representation 
of that earth goddess as well. And so we could connect to them. I mean, they're intelligent beings just like we are. They're of a higher intelligence typically than we are. They have a uh, greater scope and frame of reference than we do in this you know, limited human body that we're in right now. But we can connect with them. And one way we could connect with them is through the mantras. And so the green Tara mantra, Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha, is is an ancient ma- mantra. It's one of the best known ones after Om Mane Padme Hum. And so this is related to the mother of all the Buddhas and her manifestation as green Tara. So we can call on her by using this root mantra. And then we could expand on that. And there are other other parts that we could add to it to make it specific you know so you could add other words that would bring in world peace you know for instance yeah there's a lot we can do with that and you know our cells are always listening they're always listening for instruction and these words (coughs) mantras have certain instructions written in them so you are actually being a tara to something else and it's as above so below so each one of us are we're, we're all very, very special. Most definitely. Most definitely. So, you know, this one basically is just saying Om and salutations to she who is the source of all blessings. And so if we say Om Tare Tutare Ture Sarva Shantim Kuru Swaha, then we're basically asking her to please bring peace to the world and to all in the world. And I'll, um, I'll put that in the top of uh, this video so you guys could, you know, reference that if you feel drawn to it. And so just a beautiful, beautiful mantra. And when we repeat these over and over, the Sanskrit words, again, are in tune with our very chakras. So by pronouncing these and resonating these, we are actually tuning our chakras to a certain frequency. So in this case, it's the frequency of compassion and peace. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. And I'll give you guys all the links to this. So I wanted to share that with you. As always, thanks for your support on Ko-Fi and Patreon. God bless and namaste. Namaste.